Um, my name's Claire Squires and I'm the director, if you haven't yet met me. Um, I can't actually quite believe that here we are at the final one of our daily keynotes. And I thought just before we got them started, I wanted to just tell you a little bit about the formation of these events. Um, and I was actually looking back at my notebook yesterday, um, at what I'd written down when we first started planning these. Um, and I tried really hard to think about who our PhD researcher community um, might want to hear from, who I wanted to hear from, and certainly who we needed to hear from as well. And I think um, over the week we've had a set of sensational, entertaining, invigorating, stimulating and moving talks and performances from Val McDermott and Joe Sharp, Tanya Weltman, Kieran fenby Hults, and Priyam Bardo Gopal. Um, but when I looked at my notebook, the very first thing that I'd written down was that I wanted to have a keynote um, from our PhD researcher community. So it was my first idea. It's happened, it's ended up being our last for the Friday. Um, I put out a request for volunteers, thinking I might need to do a little bit of shoulder tapping along the way, but I did not need to at all. Within 24 hours, I got responses back from nine individuals who are gonna present eight short think pieces. Two people are gonna be sharing one. Um, and just wonderful ideas of individuals who you're gonna hear from, wanting to communicate their research, its challenges, its excitement, and its importance. Um, so here they are, assembled as a guerrilla plenary, an idea which I'd borrowed from a, a friend and colleague in turn, bringing in early career voices to a space which is often reserved for people later on in academic careers. Um, I consulted with Luz, who you'll hear from shortly, about the term guerrilla, because it does have negative and traumatic connotations. Um, but with her guidance, we're using the term to make reference to a group of people from a shared background who've come together in a collaborative way to do something with a few resources. Um, so, um, in a moment, you're going to hear from them each in turn. They've been tasked to do five minute think pieces, which is quite, really quite a big demand. So I am going to do a bit of one minute and also to warn you as well, the five minutes is up. I've got a tambourine in case you're wondering what I'm doing. Um, they've all been warned of that. Um, but you're going to hear about a rich variety of topics, though frequently settling on ideas prompted or forced by COVID-19. Um, you'll hear reflections on intersectional identities and politics, on research conducted or not under COVID, on materiality, digital and analog, and on practice-based research. So um, I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves in just a moment um, and then we'll move into the think pieces. But because there's nine speakers, there's not really, I don't think, going to be any chance to have a proper Q&A at the end. So I would really encourage everybody to share your positive thinking about what people are presenting. If you want to share resources, if it chimes with your own research and your own thinking, stick that into the chat and I'll make sure we save that as a, so we can have some form of ongoing conversation. Please do tweet about this as well. Normal hashtag, hashtag Saxa Summer 20. Um, it would be great to hear what you're thinking um, a little bit more publicly as well. So that's it from me. So I'm going to hand over for the brief introductions, first of all. So I'm asking everybody just to say what the name is, what university they're based at, what their PhD topic is. And also because we're in this kind of strange disembodied world at the moment, just to say where they are. So I'm in Glasgow at the moment. Um, so if I can just hand over, so if you want to unmute yourselves and we'll just go round the room. So first of all, Victoria. Hi there, I'm Victoria Evans. Um, I'm in Glasgow as well. And I'm a first year PhD student at Edinburgh College of Art. And my practice based PhD is called where do I end and you begin? And it explores philosophies of entanglement through moving image installation. Great, thank you, Victoria. Uh, Michael. Hello, I'm Michael Henry, uh, also first year at the Royal Conservatory of Scotland and University of Glasgow and also in Glasgow. Uh, also doing a practice-based PhD in embodiment and what I'm calling ecological selfhood in the context of the Anthropocene and climate change. Great, thank you. Aliska? Hey, I'm Alishka. I'm also first year, mostly based at Glasgow, where I'm currently at as well. And my PhD is looking at care economies in 18th century London and Scotland. Great. Anna? 
Hello, um, I'm also first year at the University of Glasgow, where I am just now. Um, my PhD is about a women's relationship to social care in the German Democratic Republic. Thank you. Uh, Jessica? Hi, I'm Jessica. I'm at St Andrews, currently in first year, uh, and I'm looking at the history of disabled people at Renaissance Courts in England and Scotland, uh, and I'm just in Hamilton near, near Glasgow. Great, thank you. Liz? <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Luz. Um, I'm a first year PhD student um, at the University of Glasgow and also Stirling University. Um, I'm in theatre studies and my work explores verbatim theatre as a way to advance testimonial justice and inclusive deliberation in Mexico, Guatemala and El Salvador. Great. Uh, Kirsty? Hi, I'm Kirsty. I'm at the University of Aberdeen and I am also currently in Aberdeen. Um, and I'm working in museum anthropology, looking at uh, women in leisured colonial contexts and reconnecting artifacts to communities that they came from. Thank you. Uh, Alison? Hi, I'm Alison and I'm with the University of St Andrews and Glasgow. I'm currently in Dalgety Bay in Fife and my PhD is investigating how different kinds of sensory experiences with archaeological collections can contribute to memory making and well-being, particularly with people affected by dementia. Great, thank you. And then last but not least, Jimmy. Hello, I'm Jimmy. I am a second year PhD at the University of Stirling. My research looks at the way Celtic language communities in Wales and the Scottish Highlands and Islands use gravestones as a form of communication. And I am sat in my living room underneath a brass rubbing of Geoffrey Chaucer's niece. Fantastic. Of course you are. Um, thank you very much. Okay, great. We're going to hand over, in that case, to our first speaker, who is going to be Victoria. Victoria, over to you. Hi. Um, <clears throat> so, well, when lockdown kicked in, um, I was just about to install an exhibition in Summer Hall in Edinburgh, as well as prepping for another two shows. And um, I was also hoping to be accepted for a group exhibition with a sculptural work specifically conceived to be touched with the hands. So obviously that's a complete no-no now. Um, there was a horrible week where the cancellations all rolled in. And um, so I felt like lockdown really hit my research pretty hard. Um, I work with multi-channel moving image installation, including sound and sculptural elements. And touch is still quite rare in a, in a gallery setting, but spatiality and embodiment are really important to how we experience installation art. And one of the senses activated in this is sensory motor perception, the sense that enables us to perceive the body's position and movement in space. And this is one of the things that I think makes installation art um, the more decentered and social form of aesthetic experience, um, more so than some of the other traditionally object-based art forms. So this physicality is really important to me, um, but I am also quite pragmatic as an artist. Um, I'm really interested in how ideas such as the virtual and the real intersect and how so-called immaterial um, forms actually have their own materiality. So I decided to respond to a couple of funding opportunities tailored specifically to post-COVID socially distanced realities um, with online exhibitions. So it has been uh, an exciting time for me in many ways, but I also feel kind of conflicted about it. So, you know, at the same time as embracing the positives, I think it's really important to ask, you know, what is being lost and forgotten or minimized perhaps in this process. I, I personally feel a great sense of loss in, in lockdown, um, even though, you know, perhaps some of these losses seem small compared to the real much bigger dramatic losses that many people are experiencing. But I've been thinking a lot about what loss and, and grief and mourning are and um, why it might be important to mark those losses and not just rush to gloss over them, even if we have the opportunity to. Uh, partly, I think, you know, grief and mourning is, is so that we can assert to ourselves and to each other um, what it is that we value, what we love and what we find worth preserving. Um, the loss of touch, of phys physical proximity to others, the simple ease or pleasure of interacting with strangers. All these things feel like they're in danger. And even though I obviously really agree with social distancing measures, a big part of me is, is screaming, you know, this feels really wrong. Um, so even as I'm preparing to exhibit online, I'm trying to question what online actually is or what it could be perhaps. 
my feeling is like the computer screen operates as this kind of portal to a shared virtual space, which in itself is amazing and miraculous. But to enter it, we not only have to kind of become disembodied, it's also such a crowded space that there doesn't seem to be a lot of room even to bring our imaginations with us. So when thinking about what installation art might be like in digital space, I'm trying to ask some really basic questions like, do we always need a screen to access the internet? Can a website ever function, you know, more like a book or the radio? Um, rather than virtual disembodied space, could the emphasis be more on distributed physical space? And really importantly, where can we find the slowness and the gaps in that online experience that allow us room for the imagination and, and to breathe? Um, Michael is gonna be continuing with this uh, uh, line of thought in a moment in a, in a quite a different way and interesting I think um, but I will just leave you with my provocation which is you know do we have to accept the digital space that we are being offered or as this be continues to become a bigger and bigger part of our lives can we actually demand a different way to engage with it um, one that perhaps allows us space more space for the body and ultimately for the imagination too Thank you. Wonderful, Victoria. Really beautiful stuff. Very, very thought-provoking as well. Thank you. Round of applause. <laughs> um, Michael, over to you. Thank you. Um, okay, got my timer going. Hi, so I'm not really going to talk about my research. I'd like to offer something we can do together for the next few minutes. So it's sort of a no-think piece explicitly. I hope that's okay. Uh, I'll be offering some prompts for us in the context of lockdown and corona and playing some music as well. So if you start hearing things, don't worry. Uh, first of all, I wanted to get is out of screen mode, as Victoria was referring to. So if you're not tethered to your computer, please lie down on the floor or stand up in an easy posture if that's better. Make sure the volume's loud enough for you to hear me. And if those options aren't comfortable for whatever reason, please just turn your chair sideways so that you're not looking at the screen. I'll give you a wee minute to do that. And now let your eyes relax and soften. Let them go out of focus. Half close your eyelids as if you're daydreaming or half asleep. Imagine you're about to smile or laugh without actually doing it. You can feel that your eyes are looking more down inside yourself than outside. And now please inhale fully and deeply, filling your belly and chest. And when you exhale, let it become a huge sigh that relaxes your whole body. Allow the feeling that you're emptying yourself, body and mind, letting go of thoughts and thinking. And again, inhaling deeply and sighing out on your exhalation, right down through your toes and fingertips, becoming empty. Try to feel yourself as just a vibrating presence consciousness in a human body. And now tune into the feeling of your skin all over your body, the boundary between you and the world. Let your skin tingle and become sensitive. And now I'd like to invite you to let go of the thought of your skin as a boundary and feel yourself radiating out into the room around you. Down through the floor, extending into the furniture, like a haze that emanates from your body. It's just something to feel with your imagination. This haze extends two meters from you in all directions. 
up to the ceiling, maybe down into your downstore neighbor's flat or into the earth, through the walls. This is your corona body. Inhabiting this two meter body, you can start to move in any way your body wants to. Don't worry about what you look like. Small movements, rolling over, raising an arm. You can also stay still if you prefer. Let your body speak, not your thoughts. And feel how your corona body shifts with you. Try and feel as deeply as you can and don't worry about what it means. This two meter body is real in one sense, just as your skin body is real in another sense. And now start to feel your corona body returning back inside your skin. Come back to your normal body. Sigh out. Open your eyes and gently come back to the screen. Thank you. I hope that was informative of something. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Fabulous, Michael. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, that was really wonderful. Uh, we are now going to head over to Eliska and Anna. <laughs> I don't know if you were just sitting down on the floor there and have only just made it back up again. <laughs> are you all right? Ready to go? Over to you whenever you're ready. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, everyone. So I'm afraid this is going to be a lot more conventional, but I feel <laughs> greatly relaxed, so thank you. <laughs> And what we're thinking about here is, is the impact of our research related to care, which is what we both work on. And the term impact has become such a buzzword in funding applications across academia. But as the current crisis has shown, issues often seems rather hollow. Doing historical research during the pandemic has become difficult as a result of practical constraints, but mostly for myself anyways, due to my own questioning of its purpose, which inevitably seems futile in the light of the world, transforming in an uncannily sci-fi fashion. The need for visible impact suddenly becomes pressing and making sense of the present reality penetrates my historical inquiry. My doctoral research studies the histories of care, so I wonder about care in the times of corona, as the inequalities within the sector are laid bare through increased pressures on health and social care systems and reduced availability of institutional childcare. For many women, lockdown means full responsibility for childcare, unraveling the lack of progress in the sharing of care between women and men and families in the society as a whole. A fact that is invisibilized under normal circumstances as large part of childcare is carried out in nurseries, schools, or by paid carers. I draw my research, uh, historical research for context and ponder the importance of understanding past care regimes to make sense of the present ones. Painfully aware of the danger of calling strictly gendered models of care traditional, as some could always say that traditional is good, tried and tested, or even natural, I focus on the importance of our understanding of care arrangements as historical, as opposed to naturalized and embedded, which allows for its greater potential for change. Histories of care, mindful of its social, cultural and economic aspects, however, are far and few, for, uh, far, are few and far between. Yet recent uh, work by feminist historians is starting to realise its crucial role in social, cultural and women's histories. Their work shows a picture of greater fluidity between forms of work, both paid and unpaid, market oriented and for subsistence, and situates care within those myriad ways of economic activities. These histories challenge the traditional narrative of modernization theory, which serves to provide us with a sort of a pat on the back for how far we have progressed in terms of gender and social equality by exposing past forms of care as more fluid and less gendered than often assumed. Allowing for a more flexible definition of care that helps us historically situate care within the social fabric of past societies, as well as their wider economies, 
and better understand the centrality of care to both. Conceptualising how care was distributed, shared and to what extent it was commodified in the past can thus help us understand how present day care economies have developed and how the association of women with most care work in the present day is a product of patriarchal structures as opposed to a natural constant. Building on the theme of historians sort of carrying out a public service and bringing out research to the present, Anna is going to relate her research in Communist East Germany, uh, specific care regimes to women's caring roles in the time of coronavirus in Germany. Thank you. So yeah, again, since my doctoral research um, looks at care within yeah, the specific context of Communist East Germany, an obvious question for me was whether the pandemic might achieve what the German government could not um, in the 1990s after the German Democratic Republic's collapse, namely um, creating better provisions for women in their roles both as caregivers and workers. So in the GDR, that being the German Democratic Republic, women had access to an overarching system of care provision, including childcare facilities, a shorter working week, sizable birth grants, and even received monetary benefits for breastfeeding. But with the GDR's collapse in 1989, all legacies of the regime were deemed as unfitting for democratic society, and so they were destroyed. The consequences of this disproportionately affected East German women. So the 92.4% of East German women in employment in 1989, more than 50% faced unemployment in 1990. The GDR state subsidized childcare facilities were also closed, welfare incentives gone without providing any kind of replacement. And so we, what we find is in contemporary writing, many East German women mourned their losses, feeling that although the GDR had been a deeply flawed political system, it had awarded women greater concessions in their caring roles and managing these caring roles with employment. But for, so for these East German women, they found themselves in an unknown landscape after reunification. And so they had to slot into prescribed roles for them in a unified Germany, where they could often only afford to hold down part-time positions to accommodate childcare, or care for elderly and ill relatives since, care, since support from, these, from the state in these areas was particularly lacking. So I'm just gonna kind of wrap all this up now. In recent years, there's been some changes regarding the provision of daycare places, and there's been new maternity and paternity regulations. And this has provided opportunities for German women to stay in employment after childbirth and manage their work-life balance. But these improvements have still been slow and their success varies regionally. So what I'm wondering is whether the global pandemic in its unprecedented and disrupted form could have any long lasting positive results regarding women's caring roles in Germany. So right now we've got about 25% of employees in Germany working from home. And this is a huge increase compared to before the pandemic. And about a third hopes to continue working from home or at least have the opportunity offered to them. So responding to this, the Minister of Labour, Herbert Heil, is going to deliver a legislative proposal in autumn to ensure that employees will continue to have the right to work from home. And this has been called the Home Office uh, Bill. But this uh, legislation has received a lot of feminist critique um, because, again, the proposal doesn't really seem to transform caring roles in the family, um, but it's just kind of suggesting how women might manage these improvements. So just to fin finish off, I believe that the coronavirus could be a catalyst for the German government who should not go back to normal, but instead should look um, to the past, finish the work of reunification and expanding their provision of care for women, and perhaps even look to the GDR for inspiration. So then the current political debate might turn out to be an important first step in providing a new ground for changing societal attitudes towards work, family and care. Sorry that I went over a bit there. <laughs> No worries, there's two of you. That was always going to be a challenge. I didn't want to stop you because it was so interesting. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. We're going to head straight over to Jessica. Hi, I'm talking today about this disabled history and age of COVID. There's no, sorry, no more. There's no disability, no disabled people. Sorry, my prompters. There's no disability, no disabled outside precise social and cultural constructions. Disability has not always been seen in the same way and a society reveals itself in the way how it treats disability. Henry Jack Stryker, who wrote A History of Disability and is the godfather of disabled history, said this, disability is fundamentally historically specific. 
At any point in time and space, it's been conceived of differently. And by studying past societies, how they treated disability, we can see what society saw as taboo or negative or celebrated. My own work on Corp Fools and Wonders looks at how the Renaissance had more of a positive view on disability than we'd assume. They treasured these figures and had, they had important roles at royal courts. Disabled history has the chance to change how we view difference in ableism today and how we can change things. The wider disability history field in court, uh, disability studies has inspired my work. Those like the Union of Impaired People Against Segregation argued that society is what disabled people what disables people. And this has went on to influence how we view disability in the modern world. What's this got to do with COVID though? In February, I was studying, um, I was on a study trip to London and I was finding a lot of evidence about these disabled individuals. A month later, I'd kind of ignored COVID in the news. A month later, I was packing my bag to leave my uni accommodation for the last time to get home before lockdown. Something became really clear to me then. And it was that at this point in time, we're going through a moment of monumental importance for the history of disability and for the lives of disabled people today. What happens now will impact the future for disabled people and our fight for equality and accessibility. The virus has shown how societies and cultures do disable people through how they treat disability. Things like remote working arrangements have suddenly became something that's much easier to do now that it's not just disabled workers, disabled students fighting for it, when it's just our voices were unheard. Alongside this, there's much more serious issues at play. Britain, like other nations, is having to decide what, dis what people get treatment when there are shortages. Those like the British Medical Journal and British Medical Association have emphasised that there's extreme ethical decisions and problems that doctors are having to face. Ideas of frailty come into play and ultimately disabled people become victims of that. Those like NICE have even suggested that autistic people and people with learning disabilities should be marked on a scale of frailty, but thankfully public backlash made them change this. There's not been any assurances for physically disabled people though. And indeed, so far, one third of all deaths of COVID in the UK have been of disabled people. The issues with this has led many disabled people to become worried about their potential care and chance of surviving. Those like Lucy Watts, a disabled activist and MBE, recently wrote of the fact that if she gets COVID, she believes she's going to die. Because when it comes down to treatment, her accomplishments and contributions to the world won't be considered, just her needs as someone disabled. For us, everything is personal and political. Alice Wong has written in a piece for Vox on what she believes to be her expendability during the pandemic. Disabled people like my mother, who has multiple chronic illnesses, are not going to make the hard decisions about treatment. Uh, it's those, them, who will bear the brunt of these ableist decisions. Our quality of life is not been decided by disabled people. It's been made by medical professionals and policymakers who are excluding us from these decisions. Disabled people cannot become acceptable collateral damage of COVID-19, Wong has said. This is a historically significant moment that will change the world and our views on dis disability forever. Aaron Tati Roy recently wrote for the Financial Times about COVID, suggesting we should think of it as a portal. It confronts us with the worst and the best of humanity. We can choose to walk through it carrying our prejudice and our hatred, or we can walk through it lightly with little luggage, imagine another world and ready to fight for it. Disabled people and our allies are fighting to ensure the legacy of this pandemic is not the loss of our civil rights we've fought for. It's a chance for ableist ideas to be swept aside and a more acceptable and accessible world to emerge. A majority of the world has been housebound and might understand some of the situations many disabled people were in before this. The Renaissance was another historical moment that had the same impact and for a period of time disabled people had cultural acceptance. Disabled histories are needed 
for academic, personal and political reasons. And during these challenging times, we need to approach it and treat neurodiversity and bodily diversity in ways that can help us reflect and look to the future. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jessica. That was really powerful. Thank you. Um, we're going to hand over now to Luth. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. That was amazing. Okay, so on the 9th of February of 2020, the president of El Salvador, Nayib Bukele, escorted by heavily armed soldiers, forced his entry into the Salvadoran Legislative Assembly. The president's transgression aimed at coercing the democratically elected members of the assembly to approve millions of dollars in loans required by the executive powers to allegedly strengthen public security. This tropical spectacle, as the New York Times called it, would result in a failed self-coup and in the destruction of the president's image in the international community as the coolest Latin American president who went viral last year after taking a selfie during his discourse in the United Nations headquarters. Yet in a country ravaged by violence and precarity, a president who has managed to significantly reduce homicides and increase the powers of the police maintained his staggering popularity and the support of his followers. This was the socio-political context of crisis that will be magnified by the threat of COVID-19. On March 21st, the government of El Salvador imposed what would become one of the strictest and lengthiest lockdowns in the world. This included a mandatory home quarantine for all citizens and increased policing by the state. The decision was welcomed by the president's supporters as it was legitimized by the potential collapse of the underfunded and already weak public health system. However, in a country of 6.7 million people, where over 2 million live in poverty and depend on informal trade, such as street sales, staying at home was a difficult, if not impossible, rule to follow. To mitigate public disobedience, the government further increased the powers of the police and the military, particularly in the poorest communities in the country. The president, in what became a performance of tough fatherly love, encouraged the police force and the military to, quote, bend a rest of two if necessary. As days went by, the people of El Salvador witnessed a militarization of public spaces that was reminiscent of the civil war that ravaged the country from 1989 until 1992. During quarantine, repression and the silencing of dissidents became a tool for governance. From arbitrary detentions of civilians in breach of quarantine rules to the witch hunt in social media of members of the civil society who challenged the anti-constitutional behavior of the president, COVID-19 triggered what I believe is the most severe crisis of democracy in El Salvador since the peace agreements in 1992. The effects of these dynamics of silence and, oppressions, and oppression and the temporary loss of the limited um, public spaces for social dialogue and participation, such as theaters, public squares, museums, parks, and universities, among others, will have long-lasting and serious consequences in democratic practice. Robert Gooden argues that internal reflections and the empathetic imagining of the other are key elements to foster healthy and solid democratic practices, particularly in context of violence and conflict. Protecting these physical spaces in a post-COVID-19 El Salvador will be key to restore public trust and to overcome the current political crisis by fostering a culture of communicative democracy that is inclusive and that is an alternative to the current political polarization in the country. The purpose of reading the short think piece today is not to get you to shed a tear for the third world in El Salvador in particular, um, but rather to expose the immense human, social, and political value of the spaces where we hear, where we speak, where we listen to others, and where we imagine together. 
it is this that I explore in my research because I believe it's important. The void that the loss of these spaces has left in Salvadoran society and in most societies around the world during this pandemic can only highlight how vital they are for the survival of our communities, of ourselves and of our democracies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. That was so insightful and just really fascinating to hear how your existing research has been amplified in some terrible ways by these circumstances. But yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, we are handing over to Kirsty now. Kirsty. Thank you. Um, so I'm not going to talk too much about COVID specifically today, but this think piece was inspired by the pandemic. Um, Rather, I'm going to reflect more on the importance of conversation as a research method and practice in arts and humanities research. Throughout the pandemic, the ability to have conversations, to share news, to support one another and find solutions has never felt more vital. I want to encourage everyone listening to reflect on the power of conversation more broadly in your own research practice. Practices of conversation are diverse, varied and permeate research. I'm an anthropologist and our discipline really boils almost entirely down to conversations with people. But I also do my research in museums and archives, dynamic spaces where conversations involve documents and people and objects, as well as people who have been long dead. Taking one object, a late 19th century Maori cloak called a korowai, I'm going to describe how a series of conversations really made up the key of my research. This beautifully decorated cloak woven from natural fibres was given to the Earl and Countess of Kintore from Aberdeenshire in 1890 when they visited the Wanganui region of Aotearoa, New Zealand. They brought it home to Aberdeen and donated it to the University of Aberdeen Museums. Now, before I had even seen the Korowai, I read about it in the Countess's journal. Her diaries have formed the basis of much of my PhD research and engaging with them has felt like a long and at times extremely difficult conversation. Clearly writing with an audience in mind, the Countess told her reader that the Korowai had been a gift from a prominent local Maori family who recognized their position as distinguished visitors. She identified the couple who gave her the cloak as Hamuera Te Kairoto and his wife Mata Rorangi. Once I had been to visit the Korowai in the museum, I set off for Aotearoa, New Zealand in 2018 to try and continue the conversation which the Countess had started. I took photographs of the Korowai as well as the Countess's journal excerpts with me. In Wellington, I spoke with Athena Tamarapa, a Maori scholar and weaver. Joining me in conversation with the Countess's journal entries, she pointed out contexts of Maori gift giving and reciprocity, which although the Countess described, neither she nor I had been able to recognise. Athena also showed me how skillfully the Korowai had been woven, letting me try to make muka, the fibres from which it is made, in harakeke leaves in her garden. Buoyed by the successful experience of conversation, I went on to Wanganui where I failed completely to have the conversations I had hoped for. I had arranged to visit the local museum to try and make connections with the descendants because Sydney had left, the Countess had left the names of the people who'd given her the cloak. However, circumstances meant that I couldn't meet my contact there in person. I sat at the side of the road in Wanganui outside the museum and cried down the phone to my partner, frustrated that I had come 10,000 miles and spoken to nobody. But that wasn't the end of the conversation. The museum sent photographs of the Korowai via email to a local expert who was able to identify patterns in the weave and then send me an email putting me in touch with the great grandson of Te Kairoto and Matarurangi. Cultural and generational gaps, time zones and technology meant that it took a really long time to arrange a conversation with this descendant. However, earlier this year we spoke on the phone for about an hour. He told me about his great grandfather's political drive for change and suggested that he likely gave the Korowai to the Earl and Countess, not simply as a recognition of status, but in the hope that they might use their influence to help people in the Wanganui region. He expressed immense frustration that his family had felt compelled to part with something so precious in the context of trying to gain reparations for colonial violence in their area. Back in Aberdeen, 
These conversations with Athena, with the descendant, have formed an important dialogue with the Korowai itself and with those who currently care for it. They have challenged the Countess's assumption that the gift was merely an acknowledgement of status and have made the museum aware of the systems of reciprocity into which owning the Korowai has brought them. The Korowai is a Tonga, a treasure, and it is connected to past owners and future generations through ties which have been made visible through these conversations. Whilst writing up this part of my research as part of my PhD, I have tried, as I have done here, to make these conversations visible in my work because they were the key of how all of this happened, ranging from very hard won and significant conversations to everyday minutiae in museums and archives. Each of these conversations has brought people together with this Korowai across continents and centuries. We take for granted in academic writing that we situate ourselves in conversation with the literature, but the conversations which occur as part of your research process, formally and informally, with friends, colleagues and participants, are integral to what makes arts and humanities research important, relevant and alive. As researchers, we have the immense privilege of being able to connect with each other and choose to foreground and empower the conversations of which we are a part at every stage of our research and future careers. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kirsty. That was a really a beautiful articulation of conversation, both metaphorical and actual. I really, really love that. Thank you. Um, over to Alison. I, I think I'm going to echo an awful lot of what Victoria has said so brilliantly um, in the context of museums. And um, anyone here who has ever worked in a museum or had the opportunity to ferret around in a store will probably know about that wow factor of handling an original artifact and the way that the kind of sensory experience of it just helps ideas click instinctively into place. Um, and how it sort of triggers a, a chain of associations and memories. And that's something we looked at experimentally in St Andrews in 2018 with an audience research project, which showed that multi-sensory experiences with material culture um, result in deeper levels of processing and richer, higher quality memories. Other researchers in the field of memory have pointed to links between object handling and positive emotions when working with people living with dementia. But so far there's little data on the relative benefits of the digital and the physical approaches. So that was something that I was at least partly focusing on for my PhD and had been planning some focus group studies with people affected by dementia and one-to-one -one observations when the coronavirus pandemic hit. And almost overnight, like many of you, I had that situation of, okay, no more access to collections, face-to-face -face interviewing, um, couldn't even submit further ethics applications. And of course, the situation with the care homes is, has been really difficult. Um, on top of which, I've got two children at home who I'm trying to keep happy and vaguely homeschooled. So my time has been a bit limited um, and I wanted to just try and put it to some use while I'm waiting to see how things evolve. Um, and I just thought, well, stand back and look at what's happening within the museum and heritage sector. How are they rising to the sorts of challenges just now? Because it's clear that lockdown presents an extraordinary time for museums, galleries and heritage sites, because at this point in time, nobody has any kind of sensory access to the collections and the treasures that they hold. Um, the only option is digital and I've been impressed how quickly they turned around and come up with the most imaginative offerings. But I asked myself, what about other people? Does anyone actually care about not being able to get inside museums and galleries and this loss of sensory access? Might I be able to kind of look into the conversations going on online and um, try and measure the effects of digital only engagement, looking for evidence of well-being? So I've basically been trawling through things like media coverage, um, participating in digital uh, professional forums online, and just listening to the kinds of issues being raised. Just to summarise quickly some observations, the main types of digital output include lots of amazing virtual tours around these spookily empty museums, um, workshops aimed at homeschoolers, campaigns like those at the Getty and the Met Museum encouraging people to use whatever you can find to hand to recreate your own version of the masterpiece and the results are utterly brilliant, you should have a look. Um, 
I have also noticed large amounts of people taking part in these things and it's generating a lot of enthusiasm, showing that museums are still able to connect in funny, relevant and meaningful ways with their audiences at a time of great stress and uncertainty. Visitors seem to like the convenience and the connection that it's providing, as well as the distraction from boredom and worry. But of course, it's sort of raised to the forefront various challenges, including that loss of aura and atmosphere and the sense of occasion of being inside a physical museum space. The digital divide is something we've heard a lot about recently, considering that 1.3 million children have been without reliable internet access. This is something that museums as educators equally need to consider that the fact that low tech solutions are still very much needed, even with wonderful online materials. Um, there's been a proliferation of online content, which again, as a parent, I've sometimes found quite overwhelming. Um, and I wonder how do the uh, cultural institutions sort of navigate themselves amongst all this and distinguish what it is they provide that is so different from each other. Um, also, given that online engagement, at least during lockdown, has been predominantly audiovisual, um, I'm thinking very much about young children and uh, visitors with additional needs who often benefit very much from the sensory engagement. So that's another challenge to overcome. Then I guess if coronavirus may be around with us uh, for some time yet, I've been looking into what the future might hold for museums in this sort of changed world. And as they begin to reopen across Europe, um, we're getting to see some of the fairly stringent public health measures, such as uh, screening off of reception staff, visitor temperature checks on arrival, cleaning regimes, pre-booked time slots, and one-way routes around exhibitions. And these things are, of course, all um, necessary for the protection of staff and visitors, but they're likely to have major effects on previous business and operational models. Um, clearly social distancing will significantly reduce footfall and incomes from ticket sales, cafes and shops. So far it's noticeable that not many hands-on exhibits and discovery centres have yet reopened and as I've argued tactile and sensory cues help us to embed and retrieve memories. I think one thing we've all learned through social distancing is that touch is a fundamental human need and so I would just like to leave you with the question what does this mean for our sense of connection with heritage and the making of future memories. I think there was supposed to be a, a, an image up there. <laughs> what I might do is just mention the fact that on the left hand side you had a picture of um, visitors hands touching this lovely sensuous greenstone boulder um, at Te Papa Tongarewa Museum of New Zealand. Um, it's a very spiritual object and every day as visitors pass they, they rub it and it represents the life force um, of the museum. On the other side of this slide, if you can imagine, oh here we go, um, yes these are some of the pretty intrusive scary looking measures outside one of the museums in Paris. Um, so yeah just a, a kind of juxtaposition of before and now. <laughs> That's uh, wonderful, Alison. Um, and again, you know, as you said, with Victoria, so many with Victoria's talks, so many kind of interesting cross currents there about loss and possibility. So thank you, thank you very much, and I'm glad we managed to get your images up there. Um, finally, um, uh, Jimmy, over to you. <laughs> Hello, stopwatch on. So uh, the main focus of my fieldwork and the main source of discursive information for my thesis is gravestones. But it's not just any old gravestones, mind you. I am looking at uh, gravestones written in the Gaelic and in Welsh in Scotland and in Wales, respectively. The problem with having to examine Celtic language gravestones whilst living in a second floor flat stuck in the middle of Edinburgh, as you can imagine, is there aren't any. Um, well, that's not quite true. There are at least two in the entire city. Hi, Ginger. Um, but that's not quite the size of data set that I'm looking for for a PhD thesis. So since the lockdowns happened, like a lot of people, I haven't been able to follow through on several of the planned activities and blocks of work that form the core of the fieldwork aspect of my research. And this includes a lot of complex, um, in-depth academic research activities, such as getting on a train to the West Coast, getting on a ferry, uh, flying to the Western Isles, staying in a hostel or a B&B or a pub or going to the pub. God, I miss the pub. 
visiting many churchyards, kirkyards, chapel yards, kilini or burial grounds that I needed to visit, or even going into church archives, the local or national library, or the local archives and museums where I need to make contacts with members of a minority language community who have a great deal of orally transmitted information that is quite simply not available to me unless I'm visiting them in person and speaking to them in their language. So how on earth am I supposed to collect, collate and synthesize all of that data with all of these restrictions in place? One way of doing that is by reaching out to my supervisors. And if any of you've come to any of my other SAGSA related talks or read my SAGSA blog posts from last year when I was the SAGSA blogger, you'll know that my main piece of advice for people at this stage of their research is talk to your supervisors because they know what you're going through and they will have some solutions. And if they don't have solutions, they'll have friends who have solutions. And my supervisors actually asked their colleagues to find potentially useful gravestones and photograph them for me on their daily COVID constitutionals. Some of them even put scale bars next to the gravestones, which was chef's kiss academic assistance. It's actually been really useful. So thank you, Sally and Kelsey. Beyond that, there are websites that I've been using. They've provided some previously surveyed sites and their contents that I can use. But as you can imagine, there's a world of difference between even the most zealously enthusiastic local genealogy group survey of a graveyard and one carried out for a PhD thesis by somebody with SAGSA funding helping out their fieldwork and with all of the support that goes with that. There's a lot that I need that I just don't have access to. Interlibrary loans have been severely restricted. Library access and digitization is dead in the water right now. And if any of you guys are working in libraries on those aspects of your work, I'm really sorry about how much of an impact this has had. And even if I wanted to, I don't have the wherewithal in this kind of heat to break into the National Records Office. I'm just too Welsh for that kind of thing. So, the bit everyone's been waiting for. How did I get my field work done during lockdown without leaving the house? I didn't. And neither of most of you. The restrictions put in place to prevent us getting this weird flu have seriously disrupted all of our research patterns, all of our abilities to build our theses and our evidence and to engage in all of the incredible research and public engagement that we want to be doing as academics. And there's a reason that I'm not in a building with you all right now, you know, <clears throat> which is a shame because I'd really like to meet Ginger. The title of this talk was a little bit misleading, so I'm really sorry that I tricked you, but sorry not sorry. I'm not here to tell you about the magical solution I found to getting field work done from my flat. I'm not here to tell you about how I got around all of the restrictions, got into a kayak and sailed solo to Iona. I didn't do any of that. This is about being in the same boat. If you've had sleepless nights, stress dreams, really awkward supervisory meetings, panic attacks about not being able to do your research and your field work, then you are not alone. This is something that's affecting all of us right now. And we're all here to provide mutual support. That's the whole point of this summer school. That's the great thing about SAGSA generally. It's a load of people all doing the same mad, stressful, ridiculously high pressure job that we are all regretting right now. But oh my God, it's going to be great when we get to wear the big floppy hat and have DR in front of our names. So everybody chill. You're going to get through this. I'm going to get through this. And if you need me and anyone else involved in this plenary right now, we are here for you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jimmy. That was brilliant. I was wanting to say some motivational words at the end, but I don't need to because you said everything I think that needs to be said. So thank you so much. And Ginger also appreciates it so much. And you were in within five minutes. So everyone was brilliant. That timing was brilliant. The content was fabulous. Um, just I haven't had a chance to read all of the group chat, but I can see how engaged everybody was with what everybody was saying that was just just superlative everything that I wanted hoped for when asking you to uh, volunteer to do this was there so so thank you for bringing such richness to today and um, whatever happens to our summer schools in the future I'm sure that the PhD researchers here in the plenary is definitely here to stay no doubt about it